New Hope TV, your encounter with God. We are in Israel. It's amazing to be here and I'm a little nervous. I've spoken about the seven wonders of the cross in many nations in the past few years, but never before in Israel. Today, we are going to Jerusalem. We're going to look for the seven locations where Jesus bled in order to discover what this means for us today. Welcome to the seven wonders in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the ancient temple city of King David and Solomon, is a modern city today with more than 760,000 inhabitants, of which 520,000 are Jews, 240,000 Muslims, and about 16,000 Christians. The history of Jerusalem is whispered in the wind and visible in the old city where every stone has its own story to tell. This is Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. It is the only city in the world that has 70 different names, each expressing an unconditional love. It is the city that is called the center of the world on old maps and is worshipped as a young bride to this very day. Jerusalem is a city with a rich and passionate history. The city is one of the most important places for Jews, Christians and Muslims. This gives Jerusalem a special combination of cultures, people and colors. This is clearly visible here in the Israel Museum. The world-famous Dead Sea Scrolls are some of the many things on display here, and there is also a large-scale model of Jerusalem as the city looked like in the time of Jesus. The construction of the scale model of Old Jerusalem was supervised by Professor Aviona of the Hebrew University. The scale model was built based on information that he found in the writings of Flavius Josephus, a Jewish Roman scholar who lived in the first century, and also on the New Testament and Jewish sources, such as the Mishnah and Talmud. The most impressive part of this scale model is, of course, the model of the Second Temple, which was built by King Herod, and which was constructed of three different kinds of marble. But why are we here? If we want to understand the seven times at which Jesus bled for us, then we must first deepen our knowledge in what happened in the temple on Yom Kippur, the great day of atonement. This day of atonement was the only day in the year the high priest, dressed in fine linen, was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies in the temple with the blood of the sacrificial animal. He was to sprinkle the blood seven times onto the golden lid of the Ark of the Covenant, which was kept in the Holy of Holies. Then he had to sprinkle the blood on the ground in front of the Ark. Sprinkling the blood on the golden lid of the Ark of the Covenant was a sign for heaven that the annual sacrifice for atonement had taken place. But why did the high priest need to sprinkle the earth with blood as well? The sevenfold sprinkling on the Great Day of Atonement was a prophetic symbol that the blood of Jesus would saturate the earth seven times on Good Friday. In this series, we are going to look for the seven locations where Jesus bled in order to discover what that means for us today. It will not be easy to find the locations where Jesus bled for us. In the past 2,000 years, Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt multiple times. The old Jerusalem from the time of Jesus is buried about 10 meters below the modern-day Jerusalem. A few years ago, the foundations and several palace walls of Herod's fort were uncovered in the Jerusalem citadel. 
It's a beautiful location to meditate on the background of the seven wonders of the cross. Those who read the Bible will discover that God was completely in control of all that took place at Golgotha. God did not leave anything to chance in the last 18 hours of Jesus' life. The Apostle Peter states twice that everything that took place in the last 18 hours was completely in line with God's will and that everything had been determined ahead of time by him. God himself wrote the script for the last 18 hours of Jesus' life. On the first day of Pentecost, Peter was completely convinced when he said, Jesus was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Later on, he says it again, for truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Peter and the apostles saw the hand of God in the last 18 hours of Jesus' life. God left nothing to chance at the most crucial moment of world history. King Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Roman soldiers and the Jewish leaders had no choice but to carry out God's predetermined plan. The seven moments in which Jesus bled were also predetermined by God. Each of them was a prophetic act, predicted hundreds of years beforehand, desired and inspired by God, and executed by sinful Roman soldiers. I'm on my way to the Garden of Gethsemane, where the most dramatic battle in world history took place, the place where Jesus' sweat fell as drops of blood onto the earth. I think this is one of the most impressive places in Jerusalem. The top of the Mount of Olives, where we are right now, is about 200 feet higher than the rest of the city. The view overlooking the old city is phenomenal. I think what touches me most, though, is the knowledge that Jesus spent the last evening before his death right here, the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane means the olive press, the place where olives were crushed until the skin split and the red juice flowed out. This is what happened to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It is here that the most dramatic battle in human history took place. Luke 22 describes it like this. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down to pray. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. The Bible says that Jesus bled for the first time on this location. His sweat fell like big drops of blood to the ground. Now, we are not discussing whether or not you can actually sweat drops of blood. The phenomenon of sweating blood is medically known as hematidrosis. There are several veins around the sweat glands which can contract under extreme stress. When the extreme emotions subside, these veins expand to the point of bursting. The blood then flows into the sweat glands, where it mixes with the sweat, and the skin excretes this blood. Pilots in fighter jets sometimes make extreme maneuvers that cause such pressure that they start to sweat blood. The question is not whether it is possible for Jesus to have sweated blood. The real question is, what was such a battle for Jesus that he started to sweat blood? It was here in Gethsemane that Jesus begged his father to remove the cup from him. What was in that cup that caused Jesus such anxiety? Of course, Jesus was distressed at the thought of the suffering he was about to go through. But there was something that he was dreading so much that it caused him to sweat blood. Johann Sebastian Bach tells us the answer in the St. Matthew Passion. The Savior falls down before his father. He is ready, 
the cup of death's bitterness to drink, wherein the sins of this world are poured and stink odiously. The cup that Jesus so feared was filled with the sins of the whole world. God asked Jesus to drink this cup in our place. Here in Gethsemane, all of our sins were pressed together into that one cup, which literally means the olive press. The sins of the serial rapist and the inhuman dictator Adolf Hitler, by whom six million Jews were gassed and murdered, all of our sins, from Adam right down to the most recently born child, were pressed together into this cup, which was held before Jesus. Jesus knew that if he were to drink the cup, he would undergo the same fate as the sacrificial lamb. The sins of the entire world would be laid upon him. But Jesus was the man without sin. He hated sin. He cried out to God and asked him to remove this cup from him. He said, Father, is there no other way to save the world? God made it clear to Jesus there was no other way to free the world from its sins. Three times Jesus asked God to remove the cup from him. But then he also said, yet not my will, but yours be done. Did you know that in the Bible, sin is called the sting of death? When Jesus started to drink the cup in our place, the sting of death deeply penetrated Jesus' soul, spirit and body. Jesus was confronted with our sins in all of these areas of his sinless life. He was made to sin with our sin. It was as if he was in the middle of a film, our sins were projected onto his retina, as it were. He responded to it with all of his senses and emotions. When Jesus started to drink the cup that was filled with our sins, sip by sip, the Bible says that he tasted death at that moment. He tasted the bloodthirsty hatred of the murderer, but also the sudden panic of the victim. He smelled the blood that was shed innocently and tasted the sperm that was violently poured out in the mouth. He heard the cries of fear and saw the results of sin in all of creation. He, the one who was completely pure in all of his emotions, was confronted with emotions that were alien to him, fear, hatred and paralyzing grief. What Jesus experienced here was nothing more than a preview of hell. Mark describes how Jesus was exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Mark used a Greek word which literally means the sorry state of the godless in hell. This is what Jesus experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane. All of the demonic powers and rulers of the darkness pounced on Jesus to ridicule him, to accuse him, to condemn him and to torment him. Gethsemane was nothing more than a horrific hell experience for the man without sin. All of our sins were pressed together in that one cup which Jesus drank for us. Everyone who believes that Jesus did this to save us will experience that there is divine power in the blood of the Lamb. Then you will receive your first wonder of the cross. Through the blood of Jesus, your cup of life, your heart will be cleansed from all sin. You no longer need to endure your feelings of guilt, shame and condemnation. You no longer need to pay for the mistakes you have made. No matter what happens, no matter where you have come from, God is waiting for you to take away every sin and every burden through the first wonder of the cross, the wonder of forgiveness. There is no religion that can free you from sin and the guilt that you are bearing. You can only experience the power of forgiveness through what Jesus has done for you. God is waiting to take you into his arms as his child and to perform a supernatural wonder in your life. Please join me in the following prayer. Heavenly Father, I believe in the sacrifice that Jesus made for me. I confess my sins today and give the cup of my life to Jesus. 
He has seen my sins. He has tasted my sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you drank my cup in my place and that I may now experience God's complete forgiveness from all my sins. Thank you, Father, that I have been approved and accepted as your beloved child through what Jesus has done for me. Amen.